talking about this process of reducing the citizen to a subject, mm. uh, which is distorting the relationship we yeah. have with the state yeah. Yeah. in a constitutional democracy. Mm. We're no longer allowed to speak up. Yeah. So I know that freedom of speech is, uh, we're always referred to the qualification mm. uh, there, uh, saying that as long as it does not interfere with national security and so on and so forth. But look at the way sedition is being used, for yes. example. Uh, it's, uh, I think, yeah, the uh, sedition, I think there have never been so many seditious uh, citizens before, before. <laughs> yes. in our history, perhaps. Yeah. And I think sedition is something that perhaps we should have got rid of at, immediately after independence, because it's a very dicey um, situation where people can use it at all. Part of decolonizing ourselves. Part of decolonizing ourselves. But nevertheless, if even if we got rid of it, determined authority will bring back something of that kind. Um, but I think that these these kinds of laws um, and talking about law, of course, one also uh, has to consider things like the judiciary, Absolutely. Um, which really in some cases, in many cases, has made judgments that one is not very proud of as free citizens. Um, and this is, again, very, very... The courts very were part of the Assam NRC process. Yes. And did not cover themselves with glory. They didn't. Yes, yes. And I think that the, um, there should be a much greater consciousness on the part of those in the judiciary about the responsibility they have, not just to the authority of the moment, but for the future. What are the kinds of laws and legalities and judgments that you're making which will affect generations to come? And this is something that they seem not to be conscious of. It is entirely a case of this moment, who's an authority, what is the issue, this is the judgment. This is a very, very narrow, almost regressive behavior uh, on the part of those that really should be thinking of judgments in terms of the kind of society that we want, the kind of society that the future should bring. And is there a certain hesitation, even apathy, um, as far as the urgent uh, yeah. needs of the moment. For example, the courts have been um, uh, dilly-dallying on coming up with a response to the various petitions against CAA, NPR, NRC. Uh, what is stopping them? No, and uh, this, uh, this is very worrisome and in a sense I think it's about time that uh, responsible members of the judiciary should explain why it is that all these urgent cases, rape, CAA, anything of this kind, uh, sedition, don't get settled fast, as they should be. I mean, you take the petition that we've been involved with, it's over a year now, it's getting on to almost two years when these nine people are in jail, under arrest. Um, there isn't even a series of trials going on, which you would expect. And there they will sit for years to come, simply because uh, the date is not being given. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is in some ways really making a mockery of a judicial system. If you're going to take so long, I mean, there are property disputes which go on for 25 years one generation dies and the next generation takes it on and does all the mm -hmm. inheriting. Mm -hmm. And you sit there and say, but for goodness sake, they're straightforward property disputes which can be settled quite quickly. Why is there this? Is it because there's a deliberate, uh, I'll take a date three months from now, or is it because there is in fact a shortage of judges? Is it because there's a shortage of trained people who understand what the judiciary is, and maybe now what we need is specialization. So that there isn't one judge who's sitting in judgment on a whole range of cases, mm -hmm. which he or she may not fully understand in some cases. Um, but something has to be done, because it is really beginning to uh, become self-destructive in some ways.
I just, I just feel that, you know, once again, this resort that, all right, I'll, I'll take it to the courts, I'll take it, I'll bring law into it. Now one hesitates and says, oh my God, I will be dead before any decision is taken. But, but Romila, as a historian, you uh, have to tell us uh, what is the way to view this movement of people um, not only within the country, as citizens, you should be allowed to go anywhere in the country that you want, but also from place to place. I mean, surely no. this is uh, the history of the human race. Absolutely. I mean, uh, whether we accept that we're all descended from the group that came with Lucy from Africa, uh, this has been a constant. Mm -hmm. The movement of people has now become much more intensive in the subcontinent. Every part of the country that you go to, the labor, construction labor, building labor, whatever it may be, is generally from UP, Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, places like that. I mean, I've just been to the Punjab, where you couldn't see a single Punjabi laborer. They were mm -hmm. all from mm -hmm. these parts. Mm -hmm. And understandably, because they're paid better and you have the whole system. They go of, where they can get lively. They, they go where you can get lively. Now, this is going to change the whole demography of the subcontinent. And they don't understand that by bringing in these laws, they are in fact interfering with the demography of the subcontinent as it would go um, under normal circumstances, which is economic circumstances, mm -hmm. if people are going mm -hmm. to travel. Um, it is not only going to interfere, but it's going to contradict. I mean, if suddenly you find a whole bunch of Assamese Muslims doing labor in, let's say, Karnatak, what are you going to do? How are you going to identify them? And the, the, the second generation will be all Canada speaking kids mm -hmm. going to schools there and that kind of thing. So there's that. But the bigger problem for me as a historian, um, is that when you look at the history of any country, and particularly of areas that in the 19th century were specially earmarked as civilizations, mm. European, Islamic, Indian, mm -hmm. Chinese, mm -hmm. you name it, what do you find? That civilization, the process of civilization, is possibly one of the most porous processes that can be imagined. People kept coming in, people kept going out, ideas were exchanged, people were exchanged, um, customs, practices. I mean, if you look, for example, I've just been completing this little uh, travelogue come diary that I've written on China. Mm. I mm. went there 62 years ago. Um, the whole Silk Route, Central Asia, it is an absolute mixture of people coming and going. Mm -hmm. including Indians. Mm -hmm. And so what are we going to do with this? How are we going to understand our own cultures if we're going to put up these barricades and say, no, nothing from there came in here or was allowed to come in here, when actually the, the, the evidence is telling you that it was absolutely fluid. People just came and went. So the importance that is given to migration today uh, and we're not the only ones. I mean, you've got this absurdity of uh, Trump trying to build a wall separating Mexico and, uh, and the Americas. Yes. Um, yes. The, this is a, and of course, a wall was built to hide uh, real uh, yes. people uh, in, in, in we slums, have in Gujarat. slums in Gujarat. Mm. Yes, yes. We mm. have this obsession today, but it's an obsession which uh, is denied by history and will be denied by history to come. It's not something that's going to last. I mean, it's, it's in some ways laughable for a historian um, to sit and watch this desperate desire to cut off people coming in, because this has happened right through history. You know, we've talked about ways in which the courts can actually engage with the situation as it's unfolding today. So, uh, in uh, the case of Shaheen Bagh, for instance, uh, the Supreme Court has sent uh, those three mediators uh, and, and there seems to be some dialogue that's being initiated. What do you think? Yes, I think that um, I, I would certainly approve more and more of that. Um, 
both with Shaheen Bagh and also with the student protests. I mm -hmm. think it's very necessary that responsible people, responsible citizens, uh, be sent to have dialogue and conversations and debates with people who, is, who are protesting. This is a civilized way of proceeding. And the Shaheen Bagh, one hopes that something will come of it. Um, you know, one doesn't have to take an extreme position and say lift the whole lot, remove them. You can say shift them to a particular area, let the protests go on, and let the, the, the dialogue go on then. People will, they should go on talking. Um, and that, that I think could be expanded further in, in, in other cases as well. Um, I'm very impressed with the women at Shaheen Bagh and felt very proud of the fact that you had Indian women who were taking such a clear-cut, firm position. Um, and then realized, of course, that in a sense, it is women in this particular protest who would have to take a central role because whatever documentation you may have, after all, eventually, it is only the mother who knows who is the father of the child, Pitri Bhumi, and who knows where the child was born and when the child was born. That kind of documentation cannot come from paper, it can only come from the mother. And I think it's very significant that these protests are being taken up by women, apart from the many other reasons why and of it's course it's women who suffer terribly, terribly in Assam yes. uh, uh, because yeah. uh, it, it, they got married, you know, yeah. they get married and go somewhere else yes. and where yeah. are they to show these documents and and given the kind of confusion that's going on where you know the woman is declared a foreigner but the, not the child mm -hmm. the separation of families is one in which the women are the fundamental sufferers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so it's very impressive that those that were being pushed way back by these laws are the ones who are coming out and protesting against them.